Welcome to Gospel Tangents, the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. In our next conversation with Dr. Daniel Stone, we're going to talk more about the vision that William Bickerton had that led him to establish the Church of Jesus Christ in Monongahela, Pennsylvania. We'll also talk about how he felt about Brigham Young as, and Sidney Rigdon when Sidney's church fell apart. Check out our conversation. I also want to remind everybody, please sign up for our newsletter and also please support us here at Gospel Tangents by uh, buying a transcript or um, becoming a monthly subscriber. I'll be sending out transcripts to everybody who uh, is a monthly subscriber for just $10 a month. We could really use your support and uh, it will help keep this podcast alive. Now back to our conversation. All right, so 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 Sydney's church basically falls apart. A few people come back to William Bickerton. He kind of watches watches over them, and, and then and then what happens? That's what's interesting. So William Bickerton is fostering this small cohort of around him, and eventually we don't know exactly how many people kind of coalesce around Bickerton, but eventually we know it's at least nine members, and. He's in a predicament because Signe Rigdon was telling him all these terrible things about Brigham Young, right? About polygamy and the idea that they're, you know, they're, you're using women and they're, they don't allow women to have independence for salvation. They have to be married to a man of the priesthood in order to receive salvation. And he's just bad mouthing Brigham Young left and right, saying he's just a complete apostate. Well, Signe Rigdon falls pretty quickly in in William Bickerton's mind. William Bickerton really doesn't have much respect for Signe Rigdon at this point. Hmm. But he still believes in the Book of Mormon. That's what's so interesting. I really would have thought, I mean, most of us would think, man, after all that, you would just go back to Methodism. But he doesn't because he even said, I was convinced of the Book of Mormon. So if he believes in the Book of Mormon, Signe Rigdon's gone awry, he's in this weird predicament. And he's hearing about Brigham Young's success in Utah. I mean... Brigham Young had brought thousands of people to the Salt Lake Valley successfully. Yeah, there was some hardship, but it's really big news. And they're creating this desert, you know, this oasis in the desert. You know, gold is swelling the coffers because, you know, the Mormons found the first, are the ones that basically start the gold rush in California. They're the ones that find the first flakes, the Mormon battalion. So, so you know, they're being blessed, you know, spiritually. Temporally, William Pickerton's hearing the, this information. He says, you know what, maybe... Maybe, maybe Signe was wrong, and he's interested. So he writes a letter to Canesville, which was the Iowa side of Winter Quarters. And I, I always found it funny that he writes a letter to Canesville, not to Salt Lake City. Probably because he, I'm guessing, because he probably wondered if, if it made it to Salt Lake City. Because, it, you know, it was the overland trails were not good. But at least Canesville, there was some, you know, more direct connections to civilization. So he writes a letter to Canesville asking for more information about Brigham Young's church. And instead of uh, people moving from Canesville, eventually you're going to have two LDS uh, missionaries that are in the East named John Murray and David James Ross. They're going to meet with William Bickerton in West Elizabeth, Pennsylvania, where William Bickerton was living, which is, right, which is a little borough right on the outskirts of Pittsburgh. It's like 15 miles away, and it's right along the Monongahela River, so re- easy access to the city. And they meet with William Pickerton, knowing that he was a convert of Signe Rigdon, and knowing that he's got this small group of cohorts around him, or, or people around him of this cohort. And they basically say, okay, let's dish it out. Let's ask for a, uh, let's figure out what we agree with and what we disagree with. And there were a lot of similarities between Signe Rigdon's church and uh, Brigham Young's church. They basically believed in the same scriptures, Bible, Book of Mormon, Book of Moses. And William Bickerton would have known of the Book of Moses because even though you know, a lot, there's not a ton of copies, William Bicker, uh, Sidney Rigdon talks a lot about it within his newspaper. So they would have had that foundation. There probably would have been some differences. Um, William Bickerton at some point in, at this time, we don't, we're not exactly sure, but maybe around this point, because Sidney Rigdon thought of himself as the new choice seer, that Book of Mormon prophet that's supposed to gather Israel. Since Joseph Smith dies, Sidney Rigdon thinks of himself of this, as the new choice seer that's supposed to mill the new Jerusalem, gather in Israel. Well, Sidney Rigdon goes awry. So William Bickerton will eventually come up with this idea that, you know what, maybe the choice seer isn't Joseph Smith. Maybe Joseph Smith was a, like, a good seer that was maybe a choice seer among the Gentiles. Gentiles, but William Bickerton comes up with this idea that maybe the choice seer is a Native American prophet that's going to rise up and kind of want to be one of the last great prophets to lead the people and gather, make the New Jerusalem. So it's a really unique idea. And he also asks the John Murray and David James Ross one important question. Are you guys practicing polygamy? 
And Ross and Murray both tell William Pickerton, no, we're not, because that was the public stance. That was Joseph Smith's public stance. Brigham Young is still practicing that public stance. And a lot of people might not necessarily, could have even have known. It's likely Ross and Murray would have known because um, one of them had at least been in Canesville. In Canesville, there was, there was um, a, a, a events of polygamy, even like big court. There was one court case of a guy that had basically had to get rid of his polygamous wives and had to go back to his first wife. So it was, they could have known about that. But William Bickerton didn't know. He thinks, oh, we're not, you guys aren't practicing polygamy. So long story short, they eventually, he eventually joins the, the movement under Brigham Young. Yeah, he should have asked if they were practicing plural marriage, probably. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. Because weren't they parsing things like that? No, we don't do polygamy. We do plural marriage. Yeah, kind of. Yeah, it was kind of like this, uh, either they would say that or they, would, they wouldn't say anything at all because the public uh, state, stance was, no, we're not doing it. Mm -hmm. So William Bickerton is a devout. LDS Mormon, and when you read the minutes, it's quite interesting. I mean, at one in one of the uh, meetings that they have, he he actually leads the vote to sustain Brigham Young and the Twelve in their offices. You know, <laughs> you know, it's kind of a ceremonial thing because obviously they don't have power, but they're he's showing their support for them, and he's a member of the LDS Church for ten months, and so. When they start the West, West Elizabeth congregation, they they appoint William Bickerton as the presiding elder, and from nine, they go from nine members. By the end of 10 months, they have 27 members. So William Bickerton helps triple his congregation within less than a year. So you know he was busy preaching. And what ends up happening is why he ends up leaving Brigham Young is because in March of 1852, there is a, a, a meeting that is held for all the Mormons in the area in Allegheny City, Pennsylvania, which is now the north side of Pittsburgh. And in that meeting, they're basically preparing the elders for the announcement that's going to come later in the year in August for plural marriage. And this is what makes William Bickerton's story so interesting is that oftentimes you read in the history books where, you know, it was kind of hush-hush and they're going to make this public announcement in August. Well, news was going out among the LDS church. And you see within the East, people were being prepared for this announcement. So that way they could help prepare their con congregations for when this announcement does come out. Well, he's told in this Allegheny City meeting, okay, listen guys, uh, Brigham Young is going to come out with this announcement soon in the year that polygamy is going to be, we've been practicing polygamy and now it's a public announcement. And if you accept this doctrine, you're going to receive God's approval. But if you don't, you're going to receive damnation. And William Bickerton, according to one account, gets up and says, well, if the approval of God were to come to me by accepting the doctrine of polygamy, I would prefer the displeasure of God. And he storms out. And that's the end of his affiliation with the LDS Church. And it's kind of a sad story because you would think, oh, here's this great, you know, triumphant, you know, you know maverick. You know, some people might be like, yeah, but William Bickerton actually in, on March 10th tells his West Elizabeth congregation and writes this affidavit and says, you know, we the undersigned have left off all connection from Brigham Young and the Twelve because of their abominations and such and such. And I'm paraphrasing. He writes this letter and he basically presents it to his, his West Elizabeth congregation and says, okay, let's sign it. Well, when you actually look at the document, <laughs> there's no signatures. So you see William Bickerton actually says he was left alone. And you could see why, because his congregation didn't sign the document. So it kind of leads us to speculate, well, why didn't they sign the document? Well, they probably didn't believe William Bickerton. And he actually does say that I was left alone. I didn't know what to do. And you can kind of see why, because even the documentation supports that. He tries to make this triumphant stand against the 12, and his own congregation doesn't even want to follow him. So even his congregation were devout Mormons. So what you can really see William Bickerton really did a lot for the LDS Church. He just did not agree with polygamy and now realizes, oh my gosh, Sidney Rigdon was right. He was telling the truth. And that just was a deal breaker for William Bickerton. So, so all these congregants, these 27 congregants, just, just go with Brigham then? Is that what happens? What ends up happening is, so William Bickerton during this time in 1852, as he's alone, he's having this real hard emotional, spiritual uh, distress. And he's trying to figure out, what am I going to do? Well, this is when he says that he has this revelation. And this is what William Bickerton, kind of where he sees him giving himself authority to kind of start a new church. And he says that he was, he was carried away in the spirit and placed on a, the highest mountain on the earth, he said. And in one of the accounts, it says that there was just room enough for him to stand on this mountain. 
And he's basically told, you know, and shown, here you are on this mountain. You're doing everything right. I, you kind of get the sense of, like, he feels like God's telling him, you're on the right track, stay where you are, keep going, keep doing what you're doing, but if you leave this, 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 this path that I've put you on, you're going to fall and tumble. And William Bickerton sees this chasm below, and he says that, the Lord told him if he didn't keep doing what he was doing, that he would fall into the chasm. And he said that the sight was awful at one part. In one, another account, he says that he would fall and be torn into bits. So it wasn't, he, he saw that he felt that he didn't, he didn't have any, really any other choice other than to stay on this path because he didn't want to fall down, fall down that way. So he starts preaching by himself. I mean, he's a coal miner. He's probably working 11, uh, seven, uh, six days out of the week, 11 hours every day. And he only gets Sundays his day off. So on Sundays, he's preaching in the streets. And what's interesting is he's in West Elizabeth. And West Elizabeth is a really popular fairy town because you have West Elizabeth on one side of the Monongahela River and you have the Elizabeth on the other side. And there's this market street and that's where he's preaching and that's where the fairies dock. So he is one of these kind of revivalist preachers. Imagine somebody standing on a corner where there's a lot of people, you know, walking, conducting their daily lives. They get, you know... The, the stocks and the goods from Pittsburgh, the daily newspapers, and it's a bustling area. And this is where he's saying, hey, everybody, you know, like, I, God's called me to preach. He's preaching these things. And this is where you start to see the, 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 mo the, mo the momentum of his movement coming forward. You don't even, we don't even know if William Bickerton's wife even agreed with him because she was a devout Mormon. It really shows that he was left to us. Even her name wasn't even on that affidavit. Wow. So it's even possible that his own wife didn't agree with him at first. So... But eventually, that congregation does eventually go back with him. Hmm. And he, that's just where and it starts in West Elizabeth, Pennsylvania. Because then the August announcement does come out. They realize that the 12 are practicing polygamy. And most of the congregants come back to him and say, OK, you're right. And they believe William Bickerton's testimony of, in Revelation of the Mountain and Chasm and say, OK, we're with you. Hmm. And this is the beginning of the Bickertonite movement. So, kind of this really kind of all around weaving story, but you kind of see it's very dramatic and this is how the Bickertonite movement starts to gain momentum. And it's very much reliant on spiritual revelation and this power. So William Bickerton, what makes him interesting, he has two claims to, in his mind, to the, to the Latter-day Saint movement, even though he was never part of the early church, never knew Joseph Smith. He believes that Sidney Rigdon was the rightful counselor after everything that happens, he's got to constantly reevaluate. You know, first he thinks Sidney Rigdon's an apostate. Well, then he thinks Brigham Young's an apostate. And now he's going to see Sidney Rigdon in, in a different light. So these are the three things. He believes Joseph Smith was a prophet of God, but Joseph Smith kind of run, went awry towards the end of his life. He believes Sidney Rigdon was a prophet of God, was supposed to be the true successor to Joseph Smith, but he eventually believes Sidney Rigdon goes awry. But, he, since, but since he was ordained under Sidney, because you know within the LDS tradition, it's very important that you have the laying on of hands by somebody that holds authority. So even though William Bickerton's staking his claim to his prophethood with his revelation, he's also staking claim to the LDS authority of, under the laying of hands because Sidney Rigdon had done that, and that was before he had apostatized. And then he looks at Brigham Young as a, just a disgusting apostate. He basically, he is despised, he despises Brigham Young. Now let me ask a question there, because, did, so he didn't have to get rebaptized into Brigham Young's church. They took his ordination from Sidney Rigdon? <laughs> nope, they rebaptized him. Oh, they did rebaptize <laughs> yeah. him. They, just because when they went to Utah Valley, they, they rebaptized everybody, kind of like a renewing of, okay. a, a renewal of, of what their dedication of what they were going to create in the Salt Lake Valley. Well, they're doing the same thing in the East, so they rebaptized William Bickerton. Okay. So when he, William Bickerton starts his movement, he rebaptizes everybody else again. So William Bickerton was baptized three times. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's very possible it's most likely he was baptized under the Methodist movement too so he would have been baptized four times three times under the Latter-day Latter Saint okay. umbrella so baptized under Sidney Rigdon baptized under Brigham Young yep. and then when he started his own thing baptized into his, own, his new church yep exactly wow. <laughs> so a lot of they're, they're very wet people <laughs> <laughs> so so that's how William Bickerton kind of starts this move his, his own movement and so he's he had to you see you see the, the, the mental gymnastics and spiritual gymnastics he had to go through. And he actually believes, even though Sidney Rigdon flat out said Joseph Smith started polygamy, and we all know Joseph Smith was the one that started polygamy because Joseph Smith truly believed he received a revelation from God. 
Well, William Bickerton actually blames polygamy on Brigham Young. Till the very day that he dies, he always believes Brigham Young did it, hmm. which is really interesting. So you kind of see why he really didn't like Brigham Young. <laughs> Well, so William Bickerton was a Mormon, and he's going to have to try to figure out where the Bickertonite uh, theology comes in is because William Bickerton didn't agree with polygamy. He thought the Book of Mormon and Jacob, in the Book of Jacob, he thought that that was just very clear, that it says no polygamy. And, you know, there's that one verse where it says, well, if I command my people to raise up seed unto me, I'll do so. Otherwise, you know, you shall hearken unto these things. His argument would have been, well, God can do that with monogamous marriages. He doesn't need polygamy. <laughs> William Bickerton was adamantly against it. So, but since he doesn't agree with polygamy, under Sidney Brigden and, and under uh, Brigham Young, he would have at least had to consider some of the Mormon doctrines of uh, baptism for the dead. Both Sidney Rigdon and Brigham Young believed in that. And Brigham Young believed in the plurality of gods, the idea of exaltation in the afterlife. So William Bickerton, but the problem with those two in Bickerton's mind is that so he initially accepted baptism for the dead, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And it's possible that he could have at least considered the idea of exaltation because that was taught by Joseph Smith in 1844 in Nauvoo with the King Follett sermon. That was kind of like the big release of it. And, you know, sometimes it takes, a, it takes a while for news to reach in the East. But we could at least consider that they would have known of the concept because we can see news is really traveling. Mm -hmm. So, but William Bickerton starts to move away from those doctrines because polygamy... The exaltation and baptism for the dead are all interlinked with each other because they're all about increasing somebody's exaltation in the afterlife. You know, the more people that you baptize for the dead for, that increases your exaltation in the afterlife because you're saving more souls for when Jesus returns. They can kind of wrap up the earth into this millennial kingdom and more people can be saved and go to the, the highest celestial glory. Same thing for um, uh, polygamy because polygamy, the more women that you're marrying the idea that more spirit children are able to be born into tabernacles of clay they can learn right from wrong and you can raise them correctly to know of god's love and then they will then you know ha they'll be able to rise up into the celestial kingdom and you know eventually become gods themselves so it's all interlinked so if polygamy is wrong in william bickerton's mind then so is baptism for the dead and so is the idea of godhood or exaltation so those three doctrines because of polygamy go out of William Bickerton's theology. So he was once a devout Mormon, and you now have to start to see him moving towards or retracting back to his Protestant roots, believing in just, you know, okay, everybody is saved based on their own merit. Women are only saved based on the, the you know, they don't have to be married to a man of the priesthood. And he, it, but still believes in the Book of Mormon. But you start to see a very much a Protestant idea and still believing in spiritual gifts so it's kind of like you know a charismatic protestant movement that believes in the book of mormon and that's william bickerton's church okay so does he completely jettison the doctrine of covenants then no that's what yeah you're asking good questions right <laughs> <laughs> yeah this is what makes william bickerton such an interesting character he really needs to be understood not only within mormonism within american religion because you see a lot of people with, they're always trying to figure out, well, where do you, you know, a lot of these schismatic groups, they're trying to figure out, well, where do we put Joseph Smith's revelations? William Bickerton actually believes in a lot of Joseph Smith's revelations and in a lot that are in the Doctrine and Covenants. One of the big revelations that William Bickerton definitely stakes his claim on is Joseph Smith's Civil War prophecy, which is now DNC 87, I believe, correct? I think so. Yeah, so, and that is a really interesting, and you see, this is in the 1850s. This is, to kind of put it within the American context, this is when, you know, states' rights and slavery Slavery are really clashing together, right? You have well, the Civil War prophecy was before that, wasn't that? Yeah, eighteen thirty-two. Yeah, that's what I thought. So it's really almost three decades before the Civil War. Joseph Smith has this prophecy, and it's on Christmas Day. That's right. And he has this prophecy that South Carolina is going to secede from the Union. Slaves are going to rise up against their masters. They're going to be marshaled and disciplined for war. It says that it says that the this I think the, it says the remnant is going to rise up and overtake the land or overtake the Gentiles or something like that. And when he says remnant, what he's talking about are the Native Americans. The remnant of the seed of Joseph are going to rise up and going to a, a kind of take over and kind of create chaos. And it says that Great Britain is going to get the help of some other European nations. They're, they're going to try to help the South. It's a really specific prophecy, almost three decades before the actual Civil War happens. 
So William Bickerton, to answer your question, is kind of picking and choosing what revelations he believes of Joseph Smith, because he still believes Joseph Smith was a prophet. He just kind of believes that Joseph Smith kind of went awry towards the end of his life, kind of like a David, you know, like a modern-day David. Well, and I know the community of Christ, um, they, it seems like they don't like anything that happened after Nauvoo. Mm -hmm. would, would, would the Bickertonites be the same way? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so they're... So they're they're okay with up to up through Kirtland, let's say. Yeah. Okay. Pretty much. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Dr. Daniel Stone. In our next conversation, we'll talk about Bicker Tonight Priesthood. Did you know that they ordain women? But below that, you have uh, priests, teachers, and deaconesses. And they aren't considered part of the erotic priesthood. They're just kind of considered ancillary positions or to the priesthood, or like an arm of the priesthood. So there, it's an ordained office. They're ordained by oil. It's a holy ordination. It is, a, it is considered a, a calling by revelation, but it's not a member of necessarily of the Melchizedek priesthood, but it is still part of the ministry. I hope you enjoyed that short clip from our next interview. If you'd like to hear the entire interview uncut, please go to our patreon.com slash gospel tangents and subscribe for just $5 a month. If you'd like a transcript of this, please click the yellow subscribe button at gospeltangents.com and I'll send you this and all future transcripts. Also, if you'd like a paperback like we've got here, those are available at our website at amazon.com. Just do a search for Gospel Tangents. Please get all updates at our Facebook page at facebook.com slash gospel tangents. We're also on Twitter at Gospel Tangents. You can also get transcripts individually at our website, gospeltangents.com shop. Finally, make sure that you subscribe on our Apple podcast page. Just do a quick search for uh, Gospel Tangents there and give us a five-star review while you're at it. Thanks again for listening. Your support helps create more Mormon history classes and podcasts such as this. And so I really appreciate you listening. Please share with your friends. Click here to subscribe, here for a transcript, and over here you'll see some more of our great videos. Thanks again.